This is why Harry Potter should be remade. The Harry Potter franchise is up there with Disney, Mario, Star Wars, and Marvel when it comes to worldwide recognition, and it'd be difficult to find someone who hasn't at least heard of Hogwarts, Muggles, or Slytherins. Since the release of the first book back in 1997, Harry Potter has spawned a billion dollar film series, several theme parks, countless pieces of fan fiction, dozens of video games, and untold amounts of merchandise, making it one of the most popular and profitable franchises in the entire world. Despite recent controversies surrounding its creator J.K. Rowling or the financial failures of the Fantastic Beasts spinoff, Harry Potter as a whole continues to remain culturally relevant. So it's hardly a surprise that Warner Brothers has announced plans to readapt the series, with each of the seven books receiving a dedicated season on the streaming platform Max. This news has completely divided the Harry Potter fandom. Some have expressed excitement over the possibility of an adaptation that's more faithful to the source material, while others have stated that the original films already succeeded in bringing the story to life, and its cast and world would be impossible to beat. With so many lackluster remakes, reboots, and revivals being released in the past decade, I can understand why people are hesitant about this upcoming Harry Potter project. After all, the original films are a source of nostalgia, comfort, and inspiration to many. But I can see the argument for it as well, considering the films wound up leaving out a lot of things from the books, with some of these omissions having a significant effect on the characters and the story. In today's video, we're going to be discussing the biggest changes that were made when adapting the Harry Potter series for film, and why with that in mind, the upcoming TV show isn't necessarily the worst idea in the world. Because I know I'll get comments about it, we're focusing on changes that had a lasting effect on the series, not one-off issues like the color of Hermione's dress or the shape of Harry's scar. Obviously, there will be spoilers. You've been warned. Let's get into it. Most people are under the impression that Harry's magical journey began in 1997 when the first book, The Philosopher's Stone, was published, or alternatively in 2001, when its film adaptation was released. But they'd be wrong. Casual fans of Harry Potter will likely be surprised to learn that the vast majority of events in the series take place in the 90s, with the first book introducing Harry at age 11 in 1991, the last book focusing on his battle with Voldemort in 1998, and his children attending Hogwarts themselves in the epilogue in the late 2010s. This confusion likely stems from the movies themselves, which are noticeably influenced by the time period they were made as opposed to the time period in the books. The first two films, both directed by Chris Columbus, are reminiscent of other supernatural kid films released in the 90s like Matilda, Halloween Town, Casper, and Hocus Pocus. And as a result, these feel the closest to capturing the correct era. 2004's The Prisoner of Azkaban brought on Alfonso Cuaron as director, and his vision for the film was distinctly different from his predecessors, with the aesthetic and tone of the film being more mysterious, foreboding, and most importantly, modern. This film had a glossiness and polish that was reminiscent of other blockbuster films from the time period like The Chronicles of Narnia, The Golden Compass, or The Spiderwick Chronicles, which effectively set a precedent for the tone and style for the rest of the series. Cuaron also brought on costume designer Janie Tamim for The Prisoner of Azkaban, tasking her with creating a more realistic and relatable wardrobe for the characters, with Tamim saying, quote, Alfonso and I decided to make it in a way more glamorous, more cool because the teenagers nowadays are extremely fashion-oriented, and in a high school, you have to be dressed up. As a result of Tamim's emphasis on relatability, the billowing jewel-toned robes of previous installments were swapped out for tailored neutral suits, while the teenage characters began sporting popular trends of the 2000s like bootcut jeans and hoodies, and wearing their uniforms in more casual ways. This was a pretty big shift from the look established in the first film by costume designer Judiana Makovsky, who went in a fantastical, medieval-inspired direction for the Elder Wizards and a timeless, academic look for the students. Tamim would proceed to costume the rest of the series, with her designs being heavily influenced by contemporary trends instead of 90s fashions, to the point that Hermione's Yule Ball gown looked like the dress in 2004's The Prince and Me, and Flor Delacour's wedding dress was a near-exact copy of a design from Alexander McQueen's Autumn Winter 2008 collection. Honestly, I could do an entire video about the costume design in the Harry Potter series, so let me know if that's something you'd be interested in seeing. One of Harry Potter's most recognizable features, besides his scar and glasses, is his incredibly unruly hair. 
something that was kind of in in the 90s but was completely done away with in the films, which I find rather odd considering there are a good deal of characters who sport unconventional hairstyles. And even to this day, I find myself jealous of Lucius Malfoy's luscious locks, which brings me to today's sponsor, MD Hair. As I've gotten older, I've noticed that the amount of hair I casually shed has gone from surprising to concerning. It's like I'm a cat or something. As a result, ensuring that my hair stays nice and thick has become one of my biggest priorities, which is where MD Hair comes in. After submitting my quiz results and scalp analysis image, their AI technology was able to come up with a customized treatment kit with all of the right ingredients for my personal hair concerns. It's so easy, it's like magic. Because everything I needed was in one simple kit, incorporating the products into my daily routine was a breeze, which is honestly one of the things that I struggle the most with. And so far, it seems to have paid off, as my hair is already starting to look healthier. So if you're done fooling around with dozens of potions that never seem to work, use my code GIRLS70, that's GIRLS, G-U-R-L-Z, to get your first month of customized MD hair products 70% off. And soon enough, your hair will be so thick that even Hagrid will be jealous. Now let's get back to the video. The films only blatantly disregard the 90s setting on a few occasions, but these anachronisms do happen. Take for instance 2009's The Half-Blood Prince. The Death Eaters destroy the Millennium Bridge in London, which wasn't built until 2000, even though this event occurs in the book in 1996. In Deathly Hallows, Harry and Hermione dance to a song on the radio, Oh Children by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, which came out in 2004, six years after this event takes place. The scene itself received mixed reactions from fans, and considering it's not in the book, it's unlikely that it'll be recreated for the TV series. But if it were, I'd love it if they chose a song that would actually have been playing on the radio in 1998. There are also a few examples of muggle technology being too advanced for the time period, with the Dursleys owning a flat screen TV and a muggle using a camera phone, which as we know, weren't a thing in the 90s. Now you might be wondering, why does this even matter? Well, first of all, considering the Wizarding World is meant to be a secret, it's rather important to make it clear to the audience that it's set in a pre-internet age, as it immediately makes it more believable that they've been able to keep muggles unaware of magic. With these events taking place pre-Western terrorism, it'd be interesting to see muggle reactions to the senseless destruction and how the Ministry of Magic would have attempted to explain it away. Even a throwaway line with a muggle-born student saying, oh, the news said it was a gas leak, would have been an interesting way to show how the muggle and magic worlds coexist, something the film series brushes over entirely. The other issue with the film's timeline being so muddled is that it makes it difficult for the audience to get a firm grasp of when prior events occurred, and how relevant they are to what's currently happening. Take for instance when Harry's parents die in 1981 and he's given to the Dursleys. The only thing in the film that allows us to know that time has passed is that Harry is older, which I'm by no means complaining about in the context of a film. But the TV show has an opportunity to show the passage of time with its costuming and set design. Considering Petunia is a very shallow and selfish woman, it'd be interesting to see her in a very 80s getup when she's first made Harry's guardian, even if for a moment, before switching to a 90s look for the remainder of the series. Considering the amount of time between the 1990s and the 2020s is the same as the 1990s and the 1960s, I really hope the TV series leans into what makes that era unique. Besides helping the audience understand the timeline of events, it'll also allow the show to visually stand apart from the films immediately. When the TV show was announced to be another adaptation of the novels, many fans expressed disappointment that it wasn't instead a spin-off prequel series taking place during the Marauders era, the period of time in the 1970s when Harry's parents were attending Hogwarts. This has long been one of the most popular eras amongst the Harry Potter fandom, with fan casts of the characters going viral on Tumblr in the 2010s and on TikTok in the 2020s. This generation of characters included the Marauders themselves, James Potter, Sirius Black, Remus Lupin, and Peter Pettigrew, as well as Lily Evans and Severus Snape, who were all in the same grade. James, Sirius, Remus, Peter, and Lily are all sorted into Gryffindor, while Severus, who had befriended Lily prior to attending Hogwarts, is sorted into Slytherin. As adults, these characters serve an important role in the series, either in a heroic or antagonistic capacity. But many fans have lamented the lack of attention paid to their childhood selves in the films, as these interactions set up the groundwork for many of the events that occur during Harry's lifetime. We're first introduced to all of the Marauders in The Prisoner of Azkaban, and continue to learn more about them in subsequent books. 
We learn that Remus is a werewolf, which causes him to act strangely and occasionally miss classes, which James, Sirius, and Peter notice, eventually figuring out a secret. Instead of turning their backs on him, which was common in the magic community as werewolves were discriminated against, the boys chose to undertake the difficult task of becoming animagi, allowing them to transform into animals and back again at will. Although this was a crime, they chose to do so in order to accompany Remus when he was in his werewolf form, protecting him and others from harm. I don't necessarily fault the early films for this omission, considering many of the books that expanded on these characters and their dynamic weren't released at that point in time, but it's definitely one simple thing the TV show could improve upon. If they actually highlighted the close, almost sacrificial friendship the Marauders had at school, it would make Peter's eventual betrayal, James's death, Remus's solitude, and Sirius's imprisonment all the more heartbreaking. Not to mention that by showing them as easygoing teenagers, we'd have a greater understanding of the severity of events that turned them into hardened adults. Because Harry is the main character, I can understand why these flashbacks weren't considered a priority in the films, but their inclusion would provide significantly more insight into other characters. In the films, we're told that Harry's father was a great wizard and a good friend by other characters, but on the few occasions his teen self appears, he's nothing more than a bully leading us to question this heroic characterization. Then, as an adult, James is stereotypically wise and calm, and we never fully understand the reason for this change. In the books, we learn that James grew up in a wealthy, pure-blood family, and because of this pampered lifestyle, he's incredibly proud and arrogant, hence his antagonistic behavior towards Severus. However, he's also incredibly loyal and hardworking, as seen through his friendship with the Marauders, as well as his academic and athletic achievements. After he begins dating Lily, he becomes a kinder, more considerate person, and by watching this growth, we become more emotionally attached to the character, making the knowledge of his death even more heartbreaking. Harry is often compared to his father, but apart from appearance and his penchant for getting into trouble, it isn't very clear to the audience that that's actually the case, which I think the TV series has the perfect opportunity to remedy. I also think the series would benefit from showing Lily in her younger years, albeit she doesn't have much development in the books either, really only spoken of by Severus Snape or Professor Slughorn, but that doesn't mean she isn't important. Considering it's her sacrifice for Harry that sets the events of the series in motion, it would be really interesting to see what she was like before she died, instead of the picture-perfect image that's presented to us. In the books, Lily remains Severus's friend even after they're sorted into opposing houses, and instantly takes a disliking to James, something which lasts for several years. It's only after an incident where Severus lashes out and calls Lily a mudblood that she finally cuts ties with him, and she only begins dating James after he changes for the better. It's this rejection that leads Severus to join up with Voldemort, but he remains in love with Lily in spite of this, and when he discovers that she and her family are to be killed, he attempts to save them all, an action that is significantly more complex when you consider how he was cruelly treated by James. If the TV show winds up being successful, I wouldn't be surprised if they went forward with an entire limited series focusing on the Marauders, but as it stands, I think they have to dedicate at least one or two episodes to the time period, not only because fans would be clamoring for it, but also because it'd be information that never appeared in the films. Now there's no denying that the Harry Potter films have one of the greatest casts of all time, with legends of the British acting scene like Maggie Smith as Minerva McGonagall, Imelda Staunton as Dolores Umbridge, Emma Thompson as Sybil Trelawney, Gary Oldman as Sirius Black, and Alan Rickman as Severus Snape, as well as young stars like Daniel Radcliffe and Robert Pattinson who would go on to become formidable forces in Hollywood. However, these acting talents came at a cost, with that cost being accuracy to the source material. Harry's parents, Lily and James, were 21 when they were killed by Voldemort, a fact most people would no doubt miss considering the actors who played the characters were 34 and 43 respectively in the first film. Part of what makes the deaths of these characters so tragic was how young they were. They were just starting their lives and their family, but by casting actors who were visibly so much older, that's immediately lost on the audience. In fact, Harry's dad almost looks old enough to have died from natural causes. Not to mention that if they were their proper age, the ending of the series would be more bittersweet, as Harry would be older than both of his parents ever were. Fiona Shaw, who played Petunia Dursley, was nearly twice the age of the character, which does succeed in making her come across as cruel and petty, but it also forces the audience to ignore that she was only in her 20s when her sister was killed. You didn't just lose a mother that night in Godric's Horror, you know. I lost a sister. 
It's also important to note that Petunia was jealous of her sister's magic abilities, and this no doubt influenced her treatment of Harry, especially once he was accepted into Hogwarts himself. So it'd be interesting to see more of that lingering envy and resentment play out in a 30-year-old. I'll be honest, I can't imagine anyone besides Alan Rickman playing Severus Snape, but 54 years old when he was first cast in the role, he was a solid 23 years older than the character he was portraying. In the grand scheme of things, I'm glad they cast him, as he gave Severus a complexity and sensitivity another actor might have ignored. But I do find myself wondering why the films went in that direction, considering all of the books up until Goblet of Fire had already been released, meaning they knew full well how old Severus was and his relation to other characters. Keeping Severus's true age in mind, his dynamic with Dumbledore changes entirely. Although Dumbledore is still significantly older in the films, with Severus being a middle-aged man, they almost come across as peers, when in actuality their relationship is more that of a student and a teacher, which sets up the groundwork for Severus to be influenced and even manipulated by Dumbledore. No matter what, Severus's vindictive treatment of Harry is inexcusable, but if he had been the correct age, the audience might have felt a little bit more empathy towards him. Sure, it's still ridiculous for a 30-year-old to bully a tween, but when you consider that James was hexing Severus only 15 years earlier, instead of 30, the grudge isn't as far removed. With Severus being noticeably older, it set a precedent for the casting of other Marauder-era characters, resulting in Sirius Black, Remus Lupin, and Peter Pettigrew all being played by actors who were in their 40s and 50s. Again, they all did an amazing job, and I think their portrayals will be tough to beat, but the characters' ages are significant to the story and their personal journey, so it does feel like the perfect place for the TV series to differentiate itself from the prior installment. If Sirius was visibly in his 30s when we first met him, the fact that he'd spent all of his adult life behind bars for a crime he didn't commit would be all the more shocking. 13 years is a long time regardless, but if you think about it as half of his life, it's chilling. In the books, Harry's relationship with Remus and Sirius is more brotherly, having effectively filled the void left by James's death. But because the characters are so much older in the films, their interactions with Harry feel more parental. That isn't necessarily a bad thing, as Sirius's death comes across as Harry losing a father all over again, but it would be interesting to see them explore more of that brotherly camaraderie in the TV series. There's also the fact that by aging the Marauders up, they appear to be the same generation as Lucius Malfoy and Molly and Arthur Weasley, who are actually a solid decade older. This age dynamic is rather important in regard to the Order of the Phoenix organization, with the Weasleys technically being older than Remus and Sirius, but not having as much experience fighting Voldemort as they weren't a part of the original group, which included Lily and James. The Black Sisters are similarly aged up. Meant to be only a few years older than Sirius, putting them in their late 30s, the characters are instead in their 40s. Again, I think the casting was simply phenomenal, and when compared to the Marauders, I don't think the change is as detrimental to the plot, with the one exception being Bellatrix Lestrange. Bellatrix was supposed to have met Voldemort in her late teens, becoming infatuated with him as a result of his manipulative and abusive behavior. With Voldemort nearing 50 at that point in time, you could interpret the relationship between him and Bellatrix as a metaphor for grooming. However, with Helena Bonham Carter only being three years younger than Ray Fiennes, this dynamic doesn't really translate on screen, and she's instead a deranged psychopath who has simply chosen to follow the Dark Lord, instead of a young woman who has quite literally spent the majority of her life under his thumb. Apart from making the setting distinctly 90s, having the characters be their correct ages is probably the easiest way for the TV show to set itself apart from the films. But I won't lie, that won't be easy. Besides having to find actors who can hold their own against their predecessors, the production will also have to be mindful of what the cast actually looks like. Because if you have a bunch of hunky 30-somethings running around with six-pack abs and chiseled jaws, it's going to wind up becoming your run-of-the-mill CW drama. As the series progressed, the books became longer and longer, with every installment from Goblet of Fire onwards being more than 600 pages. That's a lot of information to try and cram into a two-hour movie, so it isn't necessarily a surprise that certain characters had their roles simplified or were even removed entirely. Now, they did improve on some characters, like making Luna more quirky instead of strange, or highlighting Neville's bravery on more than one occasion, but that doesn't mean there isn't room for improvement elsewhere. 
Although Albus Dumbledore is ever present in the films, we as the audience learn very little about him, which you could argue is the point as it mirrors how Harry was kept in the dark, but considering how intriguing his backstory is, I can't help but find its exclusion a missed opportunity, especially since it makes you reevaluate the motivations behind Dumbledore's past actions. Fans often argue over whether Dumbledore is a hero or a villain, so it'd be interesting to see the TV series explore this moral ambiguity, considering all of the information that's now known about the character. Tom Riddle, aka Voldemort, has a backstory that is similarly glossed over, which is honestly my biggest issue with the films, as it not only provides insight into his obsession with power, but also highlights how wicked he was from the very beginning. A descendant of Salazar Slytherin, Tom considers himself a stain on the family legacy because of his half-blood background. In the books, we learn about his maternal family, the Gaunts, who had squandered their fortune, and how his mother, who fell in love with a muggle before being abandoned, died giving birth to him, with all of these events prompting his mission of wizard supremacy. While everyone is aware of how evil Voldemort is, it would be interesting to see some of the motivating factors behind his choices, especially since it would further solidify the similarities between him and Harry. J.K. Rowling attempted to comment on racism, prejudice, and discrimination through the treatment of muggle-born wizards and werewolves, but in the books, house elves are also featured prominently to metaphorically serve the same purpose. Although loved by the fandom, Dobby the House Elf makes very few appearances in the film series, only showing up in the Chamber of Secrets and Deathly Hallows Part 1. Whereas in the books, after failing to find a job after becoming a free elf, Dobby begins working at Hogwarts during Harry's third year. Because of this close proximity to the action, Dobby helps Harry during the Triwizard Tournament in Goblet of Fire, finds the Room of Requirement for Dumbledore's army in Order of the Phoenix, and spies on Draco for Harry in The Half-Blood Prince. Again, I don't necessarily think the film suffered by not including Dobby's time at Hogwarts, especially since it allowed them to give these parts to other characters like Neville. However, if you consider how upsetting Dobby's death was when we'd only seen him in two films, just imagine how brutal it would have been if we'd actually spent years getting to know him. There's also the character of Winky, who makes no appearances in the films, but in the books is framed by Barty Crouch Jr., leading her to work at Hogwarts alongside Dobby, while also becoming an alcoholic out of shame. This eventually results in a subplot where Hermione discovers the abusive conditions the Hogwarts house elves are forced to endure, leading her to start an organization for their welfare, Spew, and attempting to free them from their servitude. Although annoyed by Hermione's attempts to trick them into accepting clothes, the house elves eventually wind up fighting in the Battle of Hogwarts. This Spew subplot is one of the rare instances, besides the Time Turner, where Hermione had her own storyline that didn't revolve around Harry or Ron, so I think it's a pity that it wasn't included in the films, especially since it showed that although she had good intentions, Hermione is still the same person she was in her first year who didn't know how to communicate properly with others. By including the house elf story, it would show how she empathizes with people who are similarly discriminated against, even if she doesn't fully understand her own privilege as a wizard compared to a house elf. Apart from her interactions with Malfoy and other Death Eaters, Hermione's muggle background doesn't play a large role in the films, whereas in the books, it's clear that she's insecure about the fact, which is secretly part of the reason why she's such an academic overachiever. In the films, she seems to take to the wizarding world immediately, so it'd be interesting to see the TV series explore the fact that she comes from a totally different place with different customs and pop culture references, which could also become a way for her and Harry to bond as they both are new to magic. One criticism you frequently hear from fans is that Harry's characterization in the films is significantly less sassy than his book counterpart. In the books, Harry starts off as an awkward, depressed, and angry kid who isolates himself from others as a result of his upbringing, and humor effectively becomes a form of self-defense and a coping mechanism, allowing him to make light of the bleak situations he often finds himself in. Although he has a few one-off moments over the course of the films that hint at his dry humor, it doesn't occur often enough to be considered a part of his personality, and oftentimes he comes across as more sarcastic than he does cheeky. I feel like the filmmakers toned down his sass to prevent him from being misconstrued as a smartass, which would have made it more difficult to have an audience root for him from the very start, but I think it'd be interesting to see a version of Harry that was more snarky, especially as the events in the series become more grim. I also think the TV show would benefit from highlighting the parallels between Harry and Neville from the get-go. Neville Longbottom starts off as the butt of the joke, often misplacing his things, being bullied by others, and not being particularly adept at magic, but there are occasional moments where we can see hints of bravery and intelligence. 
It's not explored thoroughly in the films, but Harry and Neville were equally likely to have been the chosen one, with both fulfilling the requirements of a prophecy. Although both of their parents were killed, Voldemort decided to personally go after Harry, although Neville could have just as easily become the boy who lived. By highlighting how they're both orphans who were raised in neglectful households, but both choosing kindness instead of wickedness, it could highlight the strength of their character and the faults in Voldemort's. In the books, Ron has moments of insecurity and thoughtlessness, but those qualities don't dominate his character. Instead, it's his fierce loyalty and easygoing attitude that allow him to round out the trio. However, in the movies, he quickly becomes an annoyance, spending more than half the time as a jealous wreck or a bumbling idiot. It's to the point that the only reason we don't find ourselves completely despising him is because he's funny. While he was always a bit of a jokester, in the films that's his primary personality trait, and as a result, when the characters begin to interact in a more complex manner as they age, he lacks any emotional depth that allowed the audience to feel sympathetic towards him. Not to mention that he treats Hermione a lot worse in the films, which was intended to be his way of hiding his feelings for her, but more times than not, his behavior is unnecessarily cruel, and the fact that he rarely ever apologizes to her for his actions makes it even worse. The character who probably received the biggest downgrade when making the transition from page to screen is Ginny Weasley. In the books, she starts out as shy and soft-spoken, but by Order of the Phoenix, she reveals her cleverness, charm, courage, sense of humor, stubbornness, and confidence, making her the perfect match for the somewhat introverted Harry. The only girl in a house full of boys, she grows up as a bit of a tomboy, allowing her to take charge when necessary and giving her the strength to stand up against those others would be afraid of. However, in the films, she's so reserved and awkward that we're left wondering what Harry even sees in her. Besides Ginny's character development being a far cry from the books, part of the problem is the lack of chemistry between Bonnie Wright and Daniel Radcliffe. It honestly feels like they're siblings more than lovers, to the point that Luna and Harry wind up making more sense by the end of the film series. Considering this is Harry's most important romance, significantly more so than Cho Chang, I hope the TV show allows Ginny to be the firecracker she's meant to be, while also showing how much she and Harry love one another. Despite being one of the most prominent families in the series, the Weasleys are often given the short end of the stick in the film adaptations. Percy, who's an ever-present stick in the mud, is a pretty spot-on version of himself in the beginning, but the films completely fail to address his character arc. After graduating from Hogwarts, he begins working for the Ministry of Magic, choosing to side with them instead of Harry, which causes a rift in the Weasley family, with Percy's siblings voicing their hatred of him. However, Percy eventually learns the error of his ways and fights alongside his family during the Battle of Hogwarts. While we see him working for the Ministry of Magic in the films, we don't see the effect this betrayal has on the rest of the Weasleys or Harry, and when he shows up for the final battle, it lacks the emotional weight to make it a redeeming moment for his character. Charlie Weasley is missing from the films entirely, not even attending his brother's wedding or fighting in the Battle of Hogwarts, and he only appears for a brief moment in a photo. Otherwise, he's only mentioned, typically as a plot device with his job as a dragonologist providing crucial information in the Philosopher's Stone and the Goblet of Fire. I can somewhat understand why they chose not to include him. After all, we'd already met a lot of Weasleys, but considering a TV show has a lot more time to introduce characters, it'd be nice to see him at least once. Bill, on the other hand, is far more important, and he deserves significantly more screen time than he wound up getting in the films, where he's only introduced right before he gets married to Fleur Delacour. Whereas in the books, we first meet him in the Goblet of Fire when he attends the Quidditch World Cup with the rest of the Weasleys. Then he later travels to Hogwarts to help Harry with the Triwizard Tournament, which is where he first meets Fleur, who develops a crush on him. Bill later joins the Order of the Phoenix and begins dating Fleur officially, much to his mother and Ginny's chagrin, and he eventually winds up going into battle against the Death Eaters in the Half-Blood Prince, where he's brutally attacked by the werewolf Fenrir Greyback. Meant to be incredibly good-looking up until this point, this fight with Fenrir leaves Bill with scars all over his face, and Fleur, who we're led to believe is vain and superficial, accepts him for who he is, finally winning over all of the Weasleys. Side note, I always thought they went way too light on his scarring in the films, because if you looked at him from the side, he seemed perfectly normal. By minimizing Bill's presence, two other characters are made less complex, Fenrir and Fleur. Fenrir is one of the most ruthless, bloodthirsty, and terrifying villains in the whole series, but if you've only seen the films, he comes across as nothing more than your average Death Eater, whereas in the books, we learn the extent of his cruelty and insanity, with Fenrir biting children in the hopes of having werewolves overtake wizards. 
Notably, he's also the one who infected Remus Lupin with lycanthropy. Considering the only Death Eaters we see much of in the films are Bellatrix Lestrange and Lucius Malfoy, it'd be interesting to see a follower of Voldemort's who actually doesn't care about the cause at all and is simply using it as a way to achieve his own goals. The film version of Fleur is a hollow shell of her book counterpart. Although she has a decent amount of screen time in Goblet of Fire, she's a one-note character, being somewhat flirtatious, soft-spoken, and bizarrely bad at magic for someone who's supposed to be the best in her school. Whereas in the books, we're quickly made to reevaluate our perception of Fleur, initially coming across as snobby and shallow, before showing her generosity, bravery, and selflessness. Although Remus Lupin starts off strong in the film version of Prisoner of Azkaban, by the end of the series, he's a mere footnote, which is a huge disservice to the character's story arc. In the film, he's portrayed in a slightly more friendly manner, whereas in the books, he's incredibly jaded, choosing to avoid close human relationships. This comes to an end when he begins a romance with Nymphadora Tonks, who not only comforts him following Sirius's death, but also helps him accept that just because he's a werewolf, it doesn't mean he's undeserving of love. The two eventually marry and have a child, something you're bound to miss in the films, and are later killed during the Battle of Hogwarts, leaving their child an orphan. Besides their love story being practically non-existent in the films, the gravity of their deaths is completely lost on the audience. Besides Remus's death meaning that Harry's last connection to his parents is now gone, with their son becoming an orphan because of Voldemort, it's a sad parallel to Harry's life, and highlights how many generations can be affected by war. However, unlike Harry, Teddy is able to grow up in a loving home, which winds up making all the difference. Considering how bleak the series gets as it nears the end, a romantic subplot would be a welcome reprieve from all the death and disaster. Regulus Black, Sirius's younger brother, has become a fan favorite in recent years, often being fancast as Timothy Chalamet. Regulus served as a foil to Sirius, doing everything that was expected of him as a pure-blood wizard, eventually becoming a Death Eater. Unbeknownst to nearly everyone, Regulus turned against Voldemort, stealing one of his horcruxes and dying in the process, showing his bravery and selflessness. But sadly, Sirius would die believing that his brother was a Death Eater, instead of the hero that he was. I don't necessarily think he needs to become a major character, but I'm sure many fans would be overjoyed to see his sacrifice finally be acknowledged. Now, although I've spent all this time pointing out the benefits of a TV adaptation, that doesn't mean I'm 100% on board. Considering the last film in the series was released less than 15 years ago, it's pretty obvious that this is a cash grab, which definitely doesn't inspire much hope in the project, especially when you consider how lackluster the Fantastic Beasts series wound up being. It'd also be impossible to not mention J.K. Rowling's part in all of this. The author has been incredibly vocal about her transphobia in recent years, resulting in many fans renouncing the series because of her bigotry. And the idea of watching a show that she directly profits off of as executive producer is a turnoff to say the least. What are your thoughts on the upcoming Harry Potter TV show? I hope you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon! Bye!